Good evening and welcome. Welcome to the Inspired Leaders Network. That's, that's a muted... That's... I do my best to be Jerry Springer and this is what I get. <laughs> so, 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 welcome. Power of recognition tonight. Just before I bring the panel, let's just, just set the scene. Set the scene. Now, we're quite lucky. On, on the odd occasion when we get an assignment come, before we take on any assignment with any organisation, we always say, just give us 30 minutes sitting in the reception. Don't talk to anyone. Just sit down in reception. Because what we're looking for is what's the culture, the prevailing culture of the organisation. And the biggest clue is always when the boss comes in. And sometimes, you know, you get this. The CEO or one of the senior executives come in and they're staring at their phones, reading the emails that should never have been sent to them, no eye contact with anyone else, and it takes about 15 to 20 Usain Bolt seconds to cross reception in the lift. Let's repeat it. I don't speak to him. No eye contact. I'm focused on these emails. And that gives us a clue of one sort of prevailing culture. There's another sort of boss that comes along, and there's no phone in their hand. They know the names, the first names of everyone in, in reception. Margaret, how was your son's operation last week? David, how was the bar mitzvah at the weekend? And it may take them 15 to 20 minutes to cross reception. But guess what they're doing? Recognizing, acknowledging absolutely everyone. It's an investment. A couple of years ago, I had a call from the, I was, I was going up to see First Direct. First Direct Bank up in Leeds. First Direct, because it's an online bank, is really two large call centres in Leeds. About 10,000 people. At the time, the chief he said was Chris Pilling, a good mate of mine. I was going up to see Chris. And we're talking about culture, and he was telling me how great the culture of First Direct was. So, drive up to Leeds, pull up into the car park, and just as I get into the car park, there's the car park attendant, fully uniformed, high this jacket, comes out, and I'm sitting there, nervous. And he says, Rene Carriol. And I just burst into laughter, smiling. He said, Rene Carriol, here to see Chris Pilling, aren't you? I said, yes, I've got a space for you. He lifts up the bar himself and says, follow me. And he walks to the parking space, and I'm parking behind him. It's a very simple thing to do, but guess how it made me feel? I leave the car and I walk down to reception and there's two beautiful glass doors. The glass doors open, I walk in, there's three receptionists and as I walk in, the first one says, Rennie, guess how I feel? <laughs> I smile instantly back. She says, you here to see Chris? Be two minutes. She picks up the phone, she says, Chris, Rennie's here in reception for you. Chris comes down, not his PA, not his assistant, it's the chief executive who comes down. It's a really small thing. No, it's everything. Chris came down and greeted me and off we went upstairs. Really, really simple, but guess how I feel about First Direct? Guess how they've made me feel? Now there are other greetings I've had in different organisations. <laughs> and it's and the, the most wonderful one which I get so often is when I turn up with some members of my team, and especially Jackie. Jackie's our lovely lady from Nottingham. And they always come up and they walk up and they say, good morning, Rene, walk straight past me and shake Jackie's hand. And I think, and Jackie thinks, because Rene in some places can be spelt different ways for, guess how that makes me feel? <laughs> so tonight is all about recognition. We want to talk to you about the power of recognition, but we're going to link that into engagement. When engagement works well, everything in the organisation seems to work well. When engagement isn't present, recognition becomes an issue and we miss all the opportunities. Zach, kick us off with the video, just to set the scene for us. set the scene from your lives.
So that gives us the flavour of the evening. Now, I want to give a special warm welcome to our fantastic panel. Kate Bishop, come and join us, please. Give Kate a warm round of applause. <laughs> Matt Norbury, come and join us, please. Thank you. Chris Brady, come and join us, please. And Dave McLeod, come and join us, please. So, 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 let's, oh, in your own words. So, Kate, first of all, let me start with you. You're just coming to an end of your time at Pearson. Yep. When I say recognition, what does recognition mean to you? So, so to me, and, and having worked in large multinational organisations, predominantly global, recognition to me is about really understanding every person, or each person, I don't know, <laughs> as an individual and what's important to them, and then doing your best as an organisation to meet those needs. Because everybody through their ages and stages of their life and their employment has different needs. And so to me, recognition is about understanding that and doing what you can to really recognise those individuals, motivate them, inspire them, and enable them to really feel part of something, so part of an organisation within Pearson, part of education, part of being able to change the world. So I think for me, that it comes down to that, what's in it for that individual person, and then how do you meet that need from a recognition perspective? Very nice. Matt. Thanks, Rene. Um, so I'm a tech entrepreneur. I've been, um, have been for over 15 years, and I'm always looking, I'm on the hunt for answers to unmet needs is kind of what we try and do, and, and how does technology solve these problems. And my first startup actually 16 years ago was a mobile app, far too soon. And it was a cross between Facebook and LinkedIn. And unfortunately, neither of those things actually happened. Um, but you learn a lot. And when I looked at um, you know, this problem, really, recognition, it was obvious that there's a big gap between the way employers connect with employees. So for me, it's about you know, recognition is about bridging that gap. And it's about you know, making you know, the employee feel like my employer really does care and really does appreciate me. That's very nice. Chris. To me, it just, it, it sort of, it should be natural. It should be something that when we've all met tonight, we all say hello to somebody and what are you up to? This is good, this is bad. It, do, it doesn't seem as if it should be as difficult as it's been, been made out to be. Um, one of the things I, I remember very clearly was, um, towards me, but also towards somebody else. Somebody in my company, I found out he was a really good West Ham fan. I mean, I know, obviously, I should have de-recognised him at that moment. <laughs> but, um, but, but being a good boss, I thought, no, I'm going to go through this anyway. And, um, and so I got him a season ticket, which cost me, like, as a company, cost me, like, 400 quid. Now, if I'd have given him a £1,000 bonus, it would have gone like he wouldn't notice it. But the fact that I knew he was a West Ham supporter sort of meant something to yes. him, you know. Um, and, 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 you know, and then we could have banter after that about it and so on and so forth and and obviously he um, committed suicide later <laughs> on yeah. but i mean this is all all separate all, all separate but but the other but the other thing as a player i was um i was one of the workhorses i wasn't a, a real star and so if the manager had given me a specific job to do that the crowd would not notice you know he would come to me first at the end of the game even if somebody else had scored a lot of goals because he knew i'd sacrificed myself for that particular role and I'd done exactly what he wanted to do. So he would make a beeline for me straight away. Well done, you know, nobody in the crowd, in fact, the crowd were booing me, to be honest, <laughs> but nobody knew what job I'd been asked to do. And when you watch football games, by the way, keep that in mind, because somebody may have been asked to do a very specific job and you're thinking, what's he doing? He, he doesn't know what he's doing. So those, those moments where people, I don't know why we call it recognition, just, they just notice that you, you, you're doing something special and they come and just say it, well done. You know, it's not, it's, it's not, it's not difficult. Right? That, that's the problem. When David and I wrote the book, one of the things we couldn't work out was everybody was agreeing with us about the importance of engagement, but it wasn't happening. That was the, that's the real conundrum it's, for me. Um, I, I think that's something we'll maybe get onto later on. Very good. Thank you. And what was the name of the book? What was the name of the book? Um, <laughs> the Extra Mile. That's because he didn't recognise me. See? <laughs> see? You saw it there straight away. See? <laughs> See, that's why he needed me. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Please. Uh, yeah, OK. Um, I guess, uh, guess most people in this room are, are British. Yeah? Well, we've got a problem. Because we've all been born without the gene called recognition, right? So when something goes really well in your organisation, 
and you know, you're all in the room for probably a different reason, and the boss really does have to give some sort of acknowledgement of the success. Doesn't it go something like, well, that didn't go quite as badly as I was expecting. <laughs> You know, and, and I've lived, like many of us, I'm sure, I've lived and worked in the States. And their ability to kind of spontaneously recognize that they've got other problems, by the way. <laughs> but in terms of this, you know, you feel like a million dollars. You know, you, I remember going, I remember I first, uh, as a VP of this paint company, who took this plant, he said, come and meet Chuck. Chuck is really, really important to this facility. That's factory, by the way. <laughs> facility, he said, if Chuck didn't drive his forklift truck from the end of the line onto, onto the truck that takes it, we wouldn't have a factory. He's really important. Now, Brits might not put it quite that way, but Chuck felt good. I felt acknowledged. And this kind of recognition that you are as a human being, you know, you've noticed you're a fan of this or whatever, something special, some kind of connection, somebody's noticed. And actually, if I've had some success, someone's mentioned it because in the end, we're social animals. And if we feel that there's a recognition around us, then we raise our game. And that's why you're quite right, really, I believe. Recognition and engagement are very close bedfellows. Very nice, very nice. Has recognition changed over the ages? Is it better today? Is it advanced today? I think it's something to do with what David was saying there about the way we deal with things. But I think the way I always get try to get through it, at least, is be very open with, with my staff and say, look, I'm not very good at this recognition thing, you know, and it, it sort of becomes a bit of a game then, you know, they go, you know, you know hey, he, he said I did really well, you know, and, and I, yeah, so I would actually go up and say, you know, I'm not very good at this, but I'm, and, and walk away because <laughs> I, have to, I, have to, I have to deal with it. So, but if you open it up and if you're at least honest about it, they can, they can at least play with you then and mess about with you. And, and I suppose my, my, um, uh, you know, my recognition for me is that when I meet people afterwards, you know, who I've worked with, and I'll say, uh, and I'll say, how's it going? I'll say, how's it going? Is it all right? I said, and, that, and that, this is, for me, the greatest praise. They go, yeah, it's okay. They never say I'm a brilliant boss, by the way. They never say any of that. They, no, they, no, they, uh, no, 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 no. Everybody's getting that now. Um, but they, 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 they go, yeah, yeah, it's all right. Not as much fun as when you were here, though. Oh, that'll do for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and, and I think that somehow you've got to get over the fact that we're, we're British in a sense. Yeah. And, and that might be just admitting where, that you've, you, you've got failings in that area. That it's, difficult for, that it's difficult for you, you know, then they, they see a bit of humanity in you as well. Is it difficult? Um, I don't think it's difficult. I, I've lived and worked in the USA, Canada, Japan, Thailand, and I'm from Essex. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and to your point, you know, in, in a lot of those cultures and, and a lot of the time I, I ran pan-regional teams as well, it is getting back to understanding well, what drives that culture and what's underneath it and what does recognition look like in that environment? Because when I worked in Japan, if we'd used the, the Chuck example, yeah, yeah, it would have been mortally embarrassing for them to be called out and singled out um, in that way. Even though it was praise? Even though it was praise, you know, because it, it, you know, there is a saying in Japan, and I'm probably stereotyping horribly, but the nail that sticks up gets hammered down, right? In Japan, it is the team, it is harmony, you know, and so great to recognize a team, like fantastic, Very right? Good. To recognize the achievement of everybody together, but recognizing, you know, so, so I don't know if it's changed over the ages, you know, I, I, I sometimes look at my kids, I have, have nine year old twins, and, you know, when I was at school, you either like won something or you didn't. And I look at my kids and it's like, everybody gets a medal for doing sports day. I'm like, hang on a second. <laughs> like, they won, they lost, you know. So I think there's probably a pendulum culturally, both in terms of, you know, our generations and also in terms of, you know, the different countries that we, we can operate in and, and interact with. And, you know, the world is getting more global through technology. So I don't know whether it's, I don't think it's changed. I think that basic human need to be looked after, right? And, and to, to know that you are, doing the right thing that comes from the recognition and that you are valued from it. I, I don't know that that's changed, but maybe some of the ways we do it and how that looks outwardly are different. I think, I think one of the things we're seeing is employee expectations are changing. And I think employees expect a lot more of their employer and their employer's EQ and their emotional mm -hmm. intelligence and empathy. I think, and it gets talked about a lot in boardrooms, but I'm not sure how much it really translates into the, the 
actual company's DNA. And I think that twinned with how rapidly technology has changed. You know, back in, not, not that I worked in the 80s, but in the 80s and 90s, tech at work was better than that you had at home. Nowadays, the device we all have in our pockets is more powerful and less problematic than a lot of the systems we have at work. <coughs> so I think part of the challenge for the employer is changing expectations and more demands of employees. And when we say these changing expectations of employees, does this mean that they might even make the job decision based on recognition? Absolutely. Yeah, and, it, and I think it depends on your definition of recognition. If, if your definition of recognition, same as mine, is it's about authentic appreciation of an individual, then yeah, totally. I, th I think if I can add, Please. This, the, the, this point about authenticity is absolutely critical. Most of us can sniff out uh, somebody. I remember this one bloke had a, the roughest, toughest Australian boss I've ever worked for, and he suddenly said to me, David, you got kids? I said, yes, what are the names? Hannah and Henry, and right, put it in the pocket. He luckily lived in another country, and I saw him about a month or two later, and I walked down the corridor, and he was, how are Hannah and Henry? <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't give a stuff, I wish he hadn't asked. You know, authenticity is incredibly important, and I, but I do think the context has changed, and is changing. You take the big law practices, they work, you know, they, they, they think they've got the magic circle, they think they've done incredibly well, they work 24-7, uh, they get through the first year or two, and then they say, I've got to wait 20 years to be a partner. They're not listening to me. Uh, this is the, and the partners say, well, I went through that. And they say, well, you may have gone through it, chum, but you know, I want a say. I want, I want to have some influence for what's going on here uh, because I may be 25, but I've done the first years, I've got in here, and I want to be. Now, these attitudes, these expectations are definitely changing. That's why I think one of the reasons why people like working for companies such as yours, they feel far more involved, they feel more ownership, they feel much more integral to it. And the old kind of, you know, jump how high, jump, it's why now. And I think it's, I think it's even the armed forces is changing. So I think the context is changing. Therefore, this topic is getting more important. So we've got two, two sides to this. We've got the well-informed, authentic leader who realizes the more I recognize my people, the more I engage with them, the more they feel valued, the more they feel part of something special, consequently they'll give me some of their discretionary effort. Then we've got the employee schemes, employees who recognize that recognition works, it's important. Give me a view versus the, employ the employer coming up with it and the versus the good leader. The good leader surely creates the conditions in which people want to take charge and start to come up with things that they own. I mean, you take the difference between a commitment to a charity if the charity is ordained by head office or if the charity is decided amongst the group of people that are going to get involved with it. If we kick the ball, we have much more kind of skin in the game. So I think uh, giving people a chance to, uh, to, uh, to, to really be involved, to think it through, to own it and develop it, then, you know, one, one volunteer is worth... Is the ideal way. Is the ideal way, yeah. But isn't there an onus on employ employers to say, it's worth doing, we should do it, let's implement it across the organisation? I think, the, I think the, the prime need of the leader is to make it clear to everyone this is important. Now, I'm not going to tell you how to do it. Sure. I'm going to leave it to you to create do it. Create the conditions for it but to happen. Create the conditions Very for nice. it to happen. And I, I think that comes about from the employer's view of, of you know as a, an employer that you need a stickiness in your organization, right? You want people to be there. You want that discretionary effort. It costs money when you have staff turnover. There's very good reasons for doing it, but I completely agree that, that you know the strength of it comes when the board or the leadership team or whatever say, we don't think that maybe we're doing as good a job we could do at recognition, and we think that will lead to problems, or maybe it's already leading to problems but we don't necessarily have the solutions. And where I've seen it work in the most powerful way is where you then, you set up employee groups or you, know, you do things like that. And it comes very much from the groundswell and the bottom up because then it will really meet the needs of those individuals. So I think it needs to be sort of sponsored, board top, sponsored supported, you know, financially as, as well as everything else, but grassroots to be effective. Can it be institutionalized? Can we say it's such a good idea, we're going to make it the norm not, in our business? Not if it squeezes the humanity out. Mm. Same if, if it, if it's, um, um, 
In, uh, it depends how you define institutionalized. Is it institutionalized in the sense that we all buy into this, we're all at what it, it kind of tick. But if it's <laughs> we, we institutionalize that you will tick these three boxes, you will do these three things every day. I was, I was on, on a, a, a conference the other day about the need to uh, recognize and I uh, met someone in the street three weeks later. He said, I've really thought about that. He said, I've told all my managers they've got to say well done at least three times a day. <laughs> You know, disaster. It's yeah. got to be. It's got to be authentic, and it's got to be uh, right. I think you can role model lead it to institutionalize it, if yeah. you like. So, so again, to your point, you know, if you say right, you must send three thank you cards a week. It's just that's just not going to work. But if you have a leader who genuinely mm. behaves in that way, then others will copy them. Yeah. You know, so certainly for me as a HR leader, when I've sometimes worked with leaders who who are kind of going, mm, they're they're really good, but there's a bit missing, you know, or there's a bit that they could do better. And you sort of say to them, look, have you thought about talk, you know, when you talk about the business and how great the business is doing and all the rest of it, have you thought about talking a little bit more about the people? You know, just in include that a bit more. Or, you know, when you do your list of five priorities for the business, don't put the people one last. Mm. Right? Recognize that perhaps people is number one or maybe number two, because if you put it last, everyone thinks that's, your last priority and they don't feel recognized with it so there's a way of institutionalizing it maybe through behavior rather than processes if that makes sense i remember working at marks and spencers and going into the gents and finding my boss's final facts this was gold dust. I was really gold worried dust. there. I was, yeah. so gold dust. I was wondering it was whether I the I only one who was really <laughs> worried there. <laughs> so, and when i opened up for the tick list there's on the top of the to-do list for every day which you've got printed out for every day was I must tell my wife I love her. Mm. So you can imagine where that ended up. <laughs> we spread it everywhere. <laughs> but in actual fact, every day he would come in and he would do the right things every day for us as a team. He would get out of the office, wander around. He would check that everyone... But even though we realised it was part of a system, we all benefited from it. So even though we'd love it to be totally authentic, Having it is still really good, yeah, isn't it? I think it is, and I think it's about developing a habit for some people. If it doesn't come naturally, you have to do it X number of times, whatever the number is, and you, you end up learning a behavior, and I, I think you're right. You, what, the, what the, the challenge a lot of organizations have, we work with, and we work for, from companies that have, say, 1,000 employees up to 25,000, and the challenge a lot of the time is, is not the leadership and the buy-in at the top level, and not the general consensus. It's middle management, where some middle managers believe that actually I'm too busy to do this, and they get paid to do a job, so why do I need to thank them? They just don't get the, the role the employer plays in the, in the emotional needs of their people. That's the biggest challenge for me. You can put great systems around it and everything, you make it really engaging for the employees, but if you can't cut through that attitude, you really struggle. There's, so let's, let's focus sorry, on that. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of research around this, by the way. The, the, I mean, the, I'm just looking at this. Guys, green shoes here, and they're magic. <laughs> uh, no, no. <laughs> the, po the, point, the, the point I was going to... They are magic, those shoes. But uh, the point I was going to make was that there's a lot of psychological research around that says if you compliment somebody, they will feel well disposed towards you. Here's the, here's the kicker. Even if you know they're lying. <laughs> <laughs> it's the fact that... It, I know it sounds stupid. It's the fact that they've made the effort Yes. Yeah. Compliment you, even even if you think, oh, he's just making that. By the way, I'm not making that. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, even if they, uh, no, no, no. It's, uh, but even if, it, which is bizarre, but that if you want the, the ideal thing for recognition, that's got to be it. You know, I know he's lying to me. I know he doesn't really think that. But I'm glad he made the effort. So if you if you want some uh, uh, something that says says it, ev everything. That, that says it, and, and that's quite detailed research. But the key to what we're talking about here is that it still comes back in any organisation, whatever it is, about the level, about performance. And so, to me, the recognition is, tell me what, as a, as a boss, tell me what you need to really do well at your job. My job is to provide it. That's, my, that's what my job is, to provide whatever it is you need. And that can comes in different ways. And the one I re recall personally was when I was work working in the Barbican, two women came for, for a job. And they both had problems getting into the job. One had a young baby, like 
six, seven weeks old, and the other one travelled all the way from Birmingham. And I was trying to work out, you know, which one. And in the end, I said the, the one with the baby only wanted to work four days a week and wanted Wednesdays off. And it wouldn't quite fit with the business. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll pay you five days a week. You can have any day you want off if the baby needs it. But equally, if I come to you at 10 o'clock at night and phone up, don't tell me you've got a problem with a baby. Tell me we can work it out. In the five years we worked together, that never happened once. But the fact that we'd got it out into the open to start with and we'd got an arrangement and we, and we treated each other as, as, as equals really mattered because in the two instances where it could have happened, one of us sort of backed off and said, oh, this could be a confrontation here. But, but we'd gone through it. We'd, we'd, we'd established a relationship. And it's, it's as simple as that. And it worked perfectly for her because she was able to go in. A, I mean, in fact, she had another, another baby, um, you know, like a, a year later. And it never caused any problems. And so, again, you sort of look around, well, why is it causing so many problems? It begs a question that when we're trying to implement recognition as a system, as a process, as a framework, is there, is there a universal application or does it have to be customised to each individual? I think it's got to be tailored to each individual. Ultimately, that's what it comes back to, is treating people like you'd like to be treated, treating you as a human being. And therefore, the way that you are recognised, the reasons you're recognised for have to be, it can't just be automated, everybody gets a, a, you know, a well done once a week. It, can't, it has to be relevant to you. And the, the link with the reward has to be relevant for you. And I think that the mindset shift that we're seeing, and I think that needs to continue, is that employers view their employees, actually, that their lives outside work are just as important, if not more important, than their lives inside work and that they've got families and they've got all these other things going on which are crucial. And it's not about the short-term results of my business. I've got to take a longer-term view and go, well, if I value this person, really treat them well, yes, they're going to leave because everyone will move People around. Leave, yes. But when they leave, they'll talk really positively about the time they had at that employer. Um, I mean, my dad worked for P&G for, for the early part of his career. Even today, he talks about the great training he had. So like he's retired now. So they're an ambassador, and that's worth it. So, um, imagine the story, you know, he could, he could tell is, that, well, they really looked after me as an individual. They valued me. And I think that's an aspiration that companies should have. And we're seeing more and more. So it does beg the question, because it seems obvious. It seems compelling. Why don't they? Why don't we have more organisations totally embracing this? Why don't we see more great stories of recognition. Why? It's, it's recognition, yeah, recognition in, a, in a context. I mean, the worst two words in the, ma in the management lexicon in English are, in my view, human resources. Thank I you. mean, isn't that extraordinary? You know, that we've got a plant here, and we've got a human, human being there, and we view it in the, same, in the same kind of light. So to make this work, we've got to, we've got to recognize, as we've been, all been saying in different ways, we've got to recognize the individual. We've got to recognise the effort. People are recognised for, for what they do, and it's got to be authentic. When we wrote our report to, uh, to government, um, the one thing about writing a report to government, all doors open. So and, tell us a little bit about the context of the report to government. How did that come about? Uh, well, the, 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 co the context was that um, the government had no money and didn't want to pass any more legislation. <laughs> And, uh, and there was a sense that this topic was coming, yeah. this topic of engagement, wasn't necessarily call engagement, the topic of soft skill, the people side, was beginning to gather momentum, and they said they wanted a report. Uh, they wanted a report written, and they wanted it written not by civil servants. I have a huge respect for civil servants, by the way. I think they do a fabulous job in very difficult circumstances. But they asked, uh, they asked somebody called Nita Clark, and I, I believe it. Now, I really, really believe the, uh, the people I've seen, the, the, the DG level, the, the pressures on them. I've been a non-exec, three government departments. And uh, they, many of them do a very good job in very, very difficult circumstances. a whole other discussion. But we were asked to write this report, uh, and uh, it, was, it was in a year. And we spent a year going around and talking to people. And we ended up by trying to say a bit about what the topic is trying to answer the question, does it matter? And then, uh, as it turned out, the four things that were present, Rennie, Please. every time we went to organisations sure. that were doing this well. The four things we found, all predicated by a real authentic belief in the importance of this stuff, but manifested itself in four things. I'll do them very quickly. The first one was, there was a story 
that every individual in the team and for the organization held in their heads, not on a big document, mm -hmm. about where we'd come from, where our history was, where we were, where, you were talking about that before, Alex Ferguson, you know, you need to know that history. Where we came from, where we are today, warts and all, and where we aspire to go in the future. And when you go on your website, you're full of, what are we part of that's bigger than us, that we're cont contributing, that brings the best out in us because we believe in it. And that story is written not by the PR department or not by a consultant, it's, it's written by us together and brought alive and now young people social media their phones they can do little videos of what what it wants to feel like so we feel a real kind of ownership for that yes. the second yes. thing is this did you catch that research 62 percent of all americans would prefer a pay rise prefer a new boss to a pay rise <laughs> now frankly i don't suppose the numbers are that different here so what are the 38 percent doing i work for three things one is they they are they the, the, the kind of they they task me they tend me, they trust me, we know what success will look like. We spend, yes. you know, real world time, we know what bloody success is gonna look like. Secondly, in this, in this, human, in this uh, manager, he treats me as a human being. You know, if I've got childcare issues, they will try and accommodate that. If, I want to, if I'm paranoid about speaking in public, they will help me with that. If I want to develop my career, you look at uh, Costa Coffee and the effort they've put in the Whitbread, the effort they've put into helping people. You know, if you, if you want to be, if you want to look at another department, you want to join accounts, God knows where you want to join accounts, but if you did, you'd be allowed to go and spend a day with them and just find out, so they help you. And the other thing is, is exactly what we're talking about, that these places, um, people recognize, and we spend a lot about, talked a lot about that, and it's absolutely central, people feel recognized. But the other thing is this, these organizations, people do not walk past dysfunctional behavior. Very good. Mm. If there's dysfunctional behavior is addressed, because if there's a team of 10 and one's always late and you don't address it, what have you said to everyone? Start time for my meetings is entirely <coughs> optional, I'm just delighted you turn up at all. Or more importantly, you're not pulling your weight and you don't address it, everyone knows you're a weak manager, you set the standards low. So this isn't about soft, squidgy popularity. This is about the third thing is employee voice. Voice travels from marketing sales to, to uh, back office, from the most junior to the most senior. People know what's going on. And by the way, it's the cheapest smoke alarm you'll ever get. You know, how come Midstaff's Hospital didn't know there was some departments not working. Mm. You know, how come they couldn't hear the guy from Morton Farkle say it's too cold to send this challenge? How come they could they could put the concrete in the Gulf in the in the BP thing and um, real concerns about it and carry it? You know, it's the cheapest smoke alarm. You catch things because voice travels. Things yes. go wrong all the time, don't yes. they? You catch them when they're little. Uh, it costs you very little. If you wait till they're as big as you've been gaming the emissions tests in America, they cost, what's it, Volkswagen, 20, 20 billion or something? Yes. And finally, um, we called it integrity, that the values on the wall really do reflect the behaviors that uh, you see. So there's five values on the wall, and one of them is innovation, and the behavior is if you, if you innovate, it doesn't go 100% well first time, you know, you get a free one-way ticket to Siberia. You know, forget innovation. So the behavior's got to match, and those four things set in a positive context we found over and over again the not-for-profit the public sector the private sector those four things in their various contexts and forms were always uh, were always present very very clear very good I want to pick up one of those though this not walking past dysfunctional behavior so recognition isn't just about recognizing the good things it's recognizing those things that are inappropriate <coughs> as well Hughes I think virtually every worker I've ever worked with knows when they're doing something that's dysfunctional. They know, for a start. And um, I mean, when, when Kay was talking earlier on about um, everybody gets a medal, the kids know who won. Yeah. You know, so, so we're, we're, managing, we're managing people as if they're idiots. And so let's, let's look at these dysfunctional things. And, and I, the, the screensaver I always have, my staff has one, is just the word smart. And if they mess up, I'll just say, was that smart? And they go, no, maybe not. <laughs> and I go, yeah, don't, probably best not to do that again. And then they go, yeah, no, good. Because they, all, because they know, they know, yes, yes. they know. We, we all know when we're not, not pulling our weight or, you know, it, you, you know, you very rare, very rarely get the sack totally out of the blue and think, 
My God, I was doing a great job there. I didn't see that coming. I, didn't, I, I, I can't imagine why. He's, he, he, I, I'm sorry, you wanted me to turn up on time? Yeah, that was never... <laughs> was ne I, 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 I'm so sorry. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't happen. You know, you know when you're doing but it. But knowing it is one thing, recognising it is a mother. Well, no, it? but that, that's, what, that's what David's yes. saying. You don't walk past... You just, it, and it only takes something like that. You know, I mean, people talk about football, but you talk about Brian Clough. I know a lot of players who played for Brian Clough. And the idea of walking off the pitch and Brian Clough just going, was like, oh my God, you know, he's, he's giving me a thumbs up. He goes, oh, I've never had, you know. But the idea of walking off and not being shoulder, you're a dysfunctional, he would just turn his back on you. You know, so you pretty much knew straight away which was what was going on. And trust me, as a player, you know when you've had a bad game. It's very rare that you get pulled off and you think, I don't know why I've been pulled off there. I have no idea. You know, I thought I was playing really well. No, you don't. You <laughs> might you might say that. And when you see it on television, they're all going, oh, it's for you on the television, because <laughs> they know. And so that, that conversation should be fairly quick. Hey, come on, that, that's not right, is it? But it doesn't happen enough. No, okay. that's the no. point. That's the point that David was making. It doesn't. And it's easier done when it's 11 players on a pitch, right? That, you know, if yeah, but if you do... Yeah, but I, I'm sorry. This, right. this, is, this, is a, this is a common response. But... If you've got 10 direct reports and you deal with them in that way and you tell, and part of their appraisal is how they're dealing with their 10 reports, then it filters down the organisation. Yes. And yeah. one of the simple things, when you were talking about institutionalising early on, I say to my 10 reports, I will greet you every morning with a handshake. It's quite difficult to ever shake somebody's hand and not say something. <laughs> it's quite difficult to go, yeah, OK, but, you know, <laughs> you know, you're going to shake hands with somebody, you're going to have to at least say something like, how's Hannah and Henry? See, yeah. I even remembered his kids' names. <laughs> like, how's Hannah and Henry? And, uh, and so it's very easy to do that. And, of course, that conversation starts up every day. The idea of you not being connected and then not recognising when that person's done that is, is almost impossible. And if you get your 10 reports to do that for their 10 reports, You've then, created it, then, something it, then, that becomes, then it spills yes, down yes. the organisation. And it comes because you've said it. I'm shaking hands with him. Why, I didn't you, you didn't shake hands with him this morning. Why not? That's not smart, is it? Come on. You know, and everybody good. goes, yeah, all right. And even if they don't like it, it, get, it becomes sort of a game. Like, oh, that idiot, the boss, the boss wants us all to shake hands. Let's do that. I don't care. They're shaking hands, they're, they're making contact. It's almost impossible not to speak to some. I suppose it is possible, but... But uh, now I will go back to Matt. Exactly. Thanks, sorry, Matt. Sorry, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. Matt, put it <laughs> there, nice to me. Um, but My point being, that sounds great, coming from you, down to your 10 reports and down to theirs, the reality of a employer with 30,000 employees spread over 300 locations in the UK Makes that haven't tough. started today. They've been going for however many years. I've done it, it with 5,000. It, 5, it doesn't work that way. And where, where we're getting more and more requests from clients is to how can we use technology to help them sniff out people who, who aren't yes. playing ball and yes. aren't oh, shaking their fine. hand that's fine. and shine a light on it. As much as you can use it to track good behavior and say, right, we want to, this is our employee of the year or whatever you might do, you can use it great. No, to great. see where it's not happening and you focus Very on nice. those people. Yeah, and it begs the question True. that for those of our people who want to be recognized, if inappropriate behaviour is not recognised, does that detract from the value of being recognised? Kate? I, th I think it's difficult. You know, it, it's one of those ones where, almost back to my Japanese example of earlier, recognition can be very different experience for people, right? Some people might love to be, you know, pulled up in front of 5,000 people at a Salesperson of the Year award and patted on the back. You know, for others, that might be mortifying. You know, and they would rather have their boss come and shake their hand and say, you know what, you did an amazing job. You know, you, you've done this. I love the way you behaved. You know, and so it's very, I think it's very different. Yeah. Um, and, and I want to touch on the, the earlier thing. I think where you have good leaders, it's easy to call dysfunctional behavior out in many ways. Sometimes you have the challenge where the leader is the one with the dysfunctional behavior. You know, and that's super difficult. I remember joining an organization who shall rename nameless. i have been there about a month when I kind of went, you know what, this guy who I'm the HR person for him is the biggest bully I've ever met. And, you know, if, this organi if that's what this organization thinks leadership is, I really didn't do a good job on my due diligence of joining the organization. And I had a decision to make, right? I could either join the rest of the team and just kind of suck it up 
right? And and because he would bully in the meeting, and then everybody would go down the pub, have a few drinks, and he'd say to everybody, you know, I love you, you know, I love you, you're great, you know. So it was a real weird, it was very weird. Um, so I had a decision. I could either just hang with everybody else and put up with this behaviour, or I could actually kind of go, well, actually, I'm junior, but I need to do something about this because it's not right, right? It's not the, you know, that recognition that he's doing in the pub that he thinks is recognition is actually, you know, not, not very good. You know, and I went and, because I, I kind of went, I've only been there a month, <laughs> I've got a lot to lose, they can fire me, went and sort of worked it through the system and, and we ended up suggesting he find an alternative uh, position somewhere else. And then I had to take the team and retrain that team on what recognition was and what behaviour was and what was appropriate and what was not appropriate because they'd been under this dysfunctional... Um, kind of leader, so it was, you know, it was super It's a tough call though, isn't it, as yeah. an individual, especially relatively junior, oh, yeah. relatively new, it's a tough call. Mm. Yeah. But you found the courage. I just went back to my value set and, you know, for me it was about, I can't go against my values and I don't think this is right. And the organisation supported you. Yeah, yeah, and actually the, the boss of the guy um, ultimately was responsible for me to moving to a different country at some point. He asked me to go and be his HR leader. And I think a lot of it was because I had just stood up and said, this isn't, this isn't right, right? This isn't the right leadership. This is dysfunctional leadership. The recognition in that case was the sort of, you know, cuddles and hugs down the pub after. Which is lacks all the authenticity. You know, it was like, okay, this is not right. You know, this is not working. So, yes. sorry, Matt. I was going to say, I think it comes back to, you know, if you understand recognition, you have to look at the psychology behind it. Mm. And the behaviour there was undermining people's esteem. Yep. And esteem is the key to recognition. So recognition, you know, if you look at Maslow's pyramid, esteem is someone who seeks recognition or, uh, or achievement. And, and, and it's, it's one of those key pillars that if you do crack, people go to that self actualization mm -hmm. phase, they do a great job, they fulfil their potential. Flip side is if you undermine people's self-esteem, it's linked with depression and melancholy yeah. and apathy. And so actually, I think there's a, it's an obvious choice. You know, you either, you, em, you embrace that and you focus on self-esteem within the workplace and you get more out of people, or you neglect it and you run the risk of actually really doing some harm. I, I, think, I think that what Matt's just said there is really important about, you know, when he was challenging me earlier on about the numbers of people, I was trying to think when, when we were, when I was in an organising, when I was in the Navy, we had 5,000 people and, the, and I was the deputy to, to the boss. And um, I had two bosses in that time. And one of, one of them was absolutely intellectually very clever, very smart, but didn't have great people skills, but, but was a good boss and was fine. I wasn't a bully or anything. But the other one, he used to come in in the morning, this was in the days before, before email, I'm showing my age, and he used to put 10 pieces of paper on the table, blank, with his signature on the bottom. And he used to say, right, you get on with running this, this organisation, I'm going around to see everybody. And every day we'd just walk around to different departments. And so he wouldn't shake hands with everybody, but he would be in a department, say, with this number of people, just chatting, having a cup of tea. Now, as far as we could work out, what, uh, the reason I mention it now is because what he'd realise is that if he spent eight hours a day doing that as the, as the admiral, it was actually more valuable than the signing a load of bits of paper, whereas the other bloke was like, I won't, I'll cross this T, I'll do that. And now, which one of those do you think we were going to go out and die for? It's not a difficult... It wasn't a difficult, it wasn't a difficult decision. And, uh, and, and that's... The, sorry, that's the way yeah. you can. Yeah. And, and I think what that comes down to is if you ask people about management, you say, how important is people management? They say, oh, it's vitally important. How much of day do you spend on it? About 10%. Mm. You just told me it was really important. So we're heading towards a break. Before we do, I just want to take a view from everyone because we're going to set up our second half, which will be questions from the audience. So let's set up the second half. We've talked a lot about recognition. We've talked about authenticity. We've talked about that it can be institutionalised, but it better be real, it better be authentic, and it needs to be customised to the needs of the individual, not just a blanket one. We've touched on your four points, very good four points, but we've also touched on this... We got to stand up for the dysfunctional side, which Kate has exemplified. I want to leave on a positive. Best practice. What are we seeing? Anything new, anything really striking around organisations or individuals who are doing something very special around the whole recognition piece? 
I'll give you one tiny little example. I was talking to Matt about it before, which was um, <coughs> you, uh, you employ someone, you're going to pay them 30 grand, and two weeks before they arrive, a brown envelope uh, is sent to them, and it says, please sign here that anything you think of is ours, you're responsible for so-and-so, you can't take this out of the office, blah, 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 blah. you know, and, 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 and you know, you... <sighs> so this, comp this, this guy's telling me he spends another 10 pounds, and he sends them a bottle of wine and two glasses, and says, please have a drink with your partner because we're really looking forward to you joining us. Really sorry, you'll understand there's some legal easy stuff at the back that we just have to do, but the weight of this is we're just looking forward so oh, much cool. to, you, to you coming. And, and if that is in an authentic context, and in this case it was, then, then they're the people who come up, I, just one last, one last bit of context, if I may, was, uh, I was at a Brexit meeting uh, a lunch a day, and uh, someone very senior made the point, all these trade deals are one thing, but in the end, it's all about having products and services that people want to buy. And by and large, they're not developed by the chief executive or even the chief scientific officer. They're developed by all of us throughout the organisation coming up with these tweaks and twists and line extensions and breakthrough products. We're the ones coming up with this. And we are going to have to make this topic work because we've just made it really hard to do business in our, in our closest markets. So unless we come up with fantastic products with real competitive advantage, our country is in trouble. And right now, we don't do it very well, which is why we buy more than we sell. And, and does it correlate, Rennie, to the fact that we are 14th out of 16 countries for having the biggest number of disengaged employees. So we have to address this topic for the good of our country to say nothing of the good of our organizations and for good of the teams and career development of all us because you have to be engaging manager now, I passionately believe, to get on. Very good. But I love the 10 pounds on a bottle of wine and yeah. two glasses, that's just <laughs> class. Any others? I've got, I have a similar one to, to your one. So. We had a lot of change to implement at Pearson, lots of integration, lots of uh, downsizing, you know, not, not fun stuff. And so one of the things we did was created what we called an employee engagement group. So we went through sort of almost a voting process and everything and put together this group of about 12 people from each part of the business. And we worked really closely with them to say, look, we have to make some of these changes because, you know, it's not affordable to carry on as we're carrying on. Some of them are not very nice. Some of them are you know, nasty policy changes, the rest of it. Help us understand, A, how to get these changes through the organization. Please be ad our advisory board on how we can make this as easy as possible. And then C, and tell us what you'd like. What, what would help employees be more engaged? So this group did a great job. They worked on the policies. And then they came to me and said, um, ice cream Fridays. What? <laughs> ice cream Fridays. Okay, like what do you mean ice cream? Well, we'd like everybody to get free ice cream in the summer months on a Friday. So, okay, and you kind of go, it's not going to cost a whole heap of money. Biggest thing we could have ever done, like ice cream Fridays. Now we had to deal with the fact that, you know, not everybody liked magnums and some wanted this. <laughs> yeah. And then the fact that, like, we'd also implemented a lot of flexible working, work from home. And so people that went in on a Friday were writing <laughs> to us going, well, we're not in on a Friday. Can we have an ice cream ice on a cream. Tuesday? And it was like, no, it's ice cream Friday. <laughs> so like, if you want to come in on a Friday, you can have an ice cream and all that. You know, and it was such a small, tiny thing of recognition. But it, very, it, very it allowed us to almost balance these huge changes we were having to make to policies and the way things happened and all the rest of it, ice cream Friday. And again, it was because it came from that group the and management that asked, yes. what can we do? Very we know nice. we want to do something. Nice. And can I take it down to the bottom level? So we, to a certain extent, we're talking about how people in knowledge industries and all that, I'm talking about... I'm 16 years old and I go along for a job and my girlfriend waits outside for me and I go into the job and it, it was British Aluminium, I remember, it was in London and I went in for the job and it was a clerk, a sales clerk, I can't remember what it, I can't even remember what it was now and I came out and uh, she said, did you get the job? And I said, I did. They've got a squash club here. <laughs> <laughs> All I was interested in. It's job, fine, I'll do whatever job you want me to do but I'd never, I'd heard about this thing called squash and I knew there was a club but they had one. And, and do you play, t t I play tennis, well you can play squash, I'm your man. 
You know, now, and it's... you know, at you know, certain levels, you have to sort of say, you know, there's a lot of people working in factories, and, and you know, and I've done it a lot. Yeah. And and just, uh, I'll give you one tiny little story. Uh, Nationwide, we did a consultancy with Nationwide, and they were having staff morale problems. And I don't know if you know, but Nationwide's headquarters is in Swindon. Mm. Anybody from Swindon? Great. It's in Swindon, <laughs> right? And was, uh, so... And it's like it's like a sort of city of its own. You know, so it's got its own post office. It's got so they never get out, right? So so there's all these people in there, and we go round and um, and and just by chance we were asking the staff, and I said to the staff, "Oh, sorry, what are you doing there?" And this woman said to me, "Oh, I'm doing my task book." And I said, so "What's that?" She said, "Well, what we have to do is one day a month we have to go to another department and we'll see how they work, and we have to target them." I go, oh, "That's really interesting." She said, "That's bollocks." <laughs> I went, "Oh, okay. Well, uh, why is that?" She said, "This is the only place you can get a job around here." She said, "I work from nine to five, moving checks from there to there, or whatever it is. All I want to do is get out and get home. I don't want to have to do any of this. I you know, really don't." So we go back to the go back to the bosses and sort of say, did you know that 50% of your staff don't think this task was a very good idea? And they're like, well, we think it's really important. I said, no, no, 50% don't think it's important. They don't care what you think. <laughs> and uh, and they said, well, what do we do about it? I said, well, just ask them whether they want to do it. I said, because the ones who are really keen to uh, improve a career and that, they'll go, yeah, I'll spend three days. Of, I, I, I want to know everything about the company. So you've you've done what they needed. This woman and her mates over there, they don't need this. They don't want it. They just want to get on with their job. And, you know, now, you know, we have to be careful about, you know, saying that this world of work is this wonderful experience that we can all have because, actually, you know, well, I've done it, and I'm sure everybody in this room has done it at some stage or another, been in a job. Why? Because there's some things called kids over there and they need feeding, <laughs> you know, and somebody somebody keeps asking for rent the over caring there. Father. You know? <laughs> you know, yeah, I'm caring for they're my kids and they're not Hannah and Henry, because I don't care about that, because they're his kids. <laughs> Matt. <laughs> so one one of our clients is doing something interesting. They they, they are new, sorry. Um, they are they have a problem or have had a problem with uh, a big chunk of the people they hire don't join on day one. So they accept the role, but there's a, there's a time period, and they lose about half of them. Big, big problem. What they've started doing with us, on day one, when they get the offer, they get a box sent to them, really nice box, with, with different contents depending on the role, but a mug, some tea bags, some hot chocolate, and a £50 voucher. Happens to be our currency, but I'm not... Forget that. They, at that point, have to claim it, and then the company start communicating with them before they start the role. Nice. One of the nice touches they did was they sent a picture of their team, sort of selfie of their team, to the individual two weeks before they start the role. We're looking forward to you joining. And that, for me, was just such a nice use so of cool. the technology. Really cool. They've been fantastic to set the context for like, Please join me in giving them a fantastic round of applause. We're going to take a half an hour break. Please join us. There's refreshments outside, and I'll see you back at 8.15 sharp, please. Nice.